Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Brown Bag Seminar this from this Friday. And I'd like to, first of all, thank uh, Gloria Bender for being here and thank you all for being here as well. Um, as you may know, this, uh, the virtual Brown Bag uh, takes place every Wednesday and every Friday. Um, I believe that um, our moderator, Tanya Rosenberger, has posted a link in the Q&A session as an announcement of that link of where you can see all of our virtual brown bag uh, past seminars as well as uh, what's scheduled to come. What's scheduled to come. Um, so um, the way this works is uh, through Teams Live is if you have any questions, you can ask them in the Q&A tab. So it's right, uh, it's up at the top kind of right section of your screen. And um, I will ask Gloria those questions at the um, end of her presentation. Um, so with that, um, let me go ahead and introduce Gloria Bender. Um, Gloria is an industrial engineer who has had over 35 years of experience in operations and facility capacity um, analysis, conceptual design and expansion planning. She is co-founder and co-owner of Transolutions, where she was instrumental in establishing the airport landslide consulting area, including airport security and baggage systems, terminal and passenger flow analysis, and airport curbside and roadway systems. She championed development of the Operational Excellence Consulting Practice in 2009. Gloria Bender had, currently serves at uh, many projects as the principal in charge or PIC responsible for overall project quality and client satisfaction. She also serves select projects as the working project manager. Ms. Bender holds an MS and a BS in industrial engineering from UT Arlington. She is a fellow of the Institute of Industrial Engineers a member of the ACRP Oversight Committee and former chair of the Airports Council International North America World Business Partners uh, Board. The title of her presentation today is Le Lessons from a Lifelong Learner, um, Industry, Philanthropy and Policy. And with that, um, I would normally ask for a round of applause, but since we don't get to see you. I will just, I will personally applaud to Gloria as I turn, we transition to her. Thank you. So thank you very much, Jay. Just a sound check. Can everybody hear me? Somebody give me a th thumbs up. I, okay, I think that's a thumbs up. So um, thank you everybody for being willing to listen to me this morning. Um, I, I do claim to be a lifelong learner. As I've gotten older, I don't learn quite as well as has been demonstrated trying to get the auto visual going for this morning, My, but I have an excellent team here helping me. So just a little bit about what I'll talk about today. I thought it would be useful to talk about my unusual path and all my learnings along the way. I thought that might be useful to students who might have taken sort of an unusual path to their degree. Um, and I can talk about some of the some of the things I did to try to make me successful as I went along. I'll also talk about the how I what I do today. Um, as Jay said, uh, owner co-owner of Trans Solutions, and I'll tell you more about that. And then there's two things, I, there's two passions that I have picked up as I have gotten, you know, after owning a company for 24 years, um, after you get the company going, you start to understand some other things. And so there's two passions I've picked up that I wanted to share with you. One is philanthropy and its importance. And the other is how important it is for technical people to get involved in policy. And then I'll share, you know, sort of my parting thoughts and then uh, we'll turn it over to Jay for questions. So in terms of my unusual path, uh, something you need to understand is that I was a serial college major. First, I ma majored in theater. Then I major majored in biology. Then I really thought I'd found myself and I majored in psychology. And when that failed, I decided I was wasting my money because at that point it was my money and my husband's money. Um, and I just decided I needed to, I knew I wanted to get a college degree, but I just really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I became a college dropout. 
Um, my mother was very distressed, as, as were other uh, important people in my life. But I supported myself in, in two different areas that were very useful to me as, I've, as I went along in my career. One, I served as a paralegal for about two and a half years. And then the other one, which became extremely important to me, was I was the executive secretary to the head of industrial engineering at a consulting engineering firm. And that is where I met a good friend who pointed me in the direction of industrial engineering. And I decided that I would give it a whirl. Um, my, mom, my mom had always insisted that I take advanced math in high school. So that is kind of one of the things that helped me get from a theater major to, um, you know, to engineering. But um, anyway, I announced to my boss that I was quitting and I was going to come to the University of Texas at Arlington um, to study industrial engineering because that's where we could get a job where my husband could in, could support us while we were while we while we were going through college while I was going for, through college and he was helping me. So I got my bachelor's of industrial engineering <clears throat> in May of 1988. You'll notice that I had a little I, I, I had a, I had a gap several semesters between my master's and my bachelor's. That was because I really seriously wanted to collect some money as an industrial engineer before I before I collected Social Security. So decided to go, you know, to go enter the workforce. Um, I worked for Sky Chefs at that time that that may not be meaningful to people. It's an airline catering firm and at the time I worked for them, they owned both catering kitchens for airlines because we used to put a lot of food on airplanes, not so much anymore. They also owned airport restaurants. So I ended up learning two, two different uh, industries at Sky Chefs, stayed with them for about four years. The company was going to be divested and I wasn't sure that I wanted to go that direction. So I had the opportunity to take a job at Texas Instruments as a quality reliability assurance engineer on a black program. That was very interesting. Um, people were re people were using uh, physics that I, you know, that were different than what I had just learned in school four years ago. So great job. Worked for Jostens, pretty lucky. I thought that was my dream job. It turns out it wasn't, but I was the engineering manager for their ring production plant that's up in Denton. And uh, when I discovered it was not my dream job and I was driving, you know, very long distance to, to, uh, to Denton every day, I was passing American Airlines and I was thinking, huh, that might be my dream job. <laughs> and so um, anyway, so I got the job at American Airlines. Um, a, a friend, again, Network helped me get that job. Um, I will take this moment to say that mostly networking is how I've ever gotten every job in my in my career. Um, so anyway, I stayed at American and that's a bit of a saga, but um, I've been doing the same things that I did at American for the last you know thirty years. Um, started to be started our company in nineteen ninety eight. So with that, I'll talk about so this is the kind of lifelong learning part along the way. So um, even though I was a college dropout, I still took classes at night at the at UTA at uh, UTA to um, no at, um, at UMSL to study some different things. One was uh, Japanese history. I don't know why I thought that was so important, but I do have a good insight into Japanese uh, mar marketing and business and we do some projects in J Japan. I also took cultural and physical anthropology. Um, it was very interesting. It's a nice complement to psychology and the things that you learn in in psychology. And I, I used a lot of the cultural anthropology in some of the work, the applied research projects that our company does these days. So then I switched to, um, got my degree, uh, took a job at Sky Chefs, and that's when I needed to learn the food and beverage and retail industry and also the airline operations industry. And those are not the things that we learn in engineering school. We learn, we, we come out of school with a set of tool, a toolbox, especially industrial engineers, that we can then apply to whatever job we have to learn. And it's very important to learn the uh, the environment that you're working for if you're going to be effective. And so 
basically, um, I learned all of that from going to from reading every magazine I could find and every uh, article on those topics. So um, was successful at Sky Chefs. I also at that point, uh, my last, you know, one of the things I was able to do at Sky Chefs was convince them they needed to use computer simulation modeling to help design their flight kitchens and restaurant airport restaurants. It was that tool that ultimately ultimately got my job at American Airlines. So um, all of these things, you know, it's a circuitous path, but they've all been useful. Next, I went to Texas Instruments uh, and was a quality reliability assurance engineer. That's when I got involved uh, to, to, to help a black program um, be successful as the company sold their R&D um, element for this black program. And so my, my responsibility was to ensure that all of the manufacturing protocols uh, were compliant with the Department of Defense quality assurance and quality control methodologies. At that point in time, you know, I'm so old that that was the old DOD paper chase for quality and reliability uh, engineering. Um, so it's, I don't know, I, that probably doesn't mean a lot to everybody, but, but what that means is that you study the standards, you have a very strict set of rules that you follow, the quality, assurance reliability engineer is the one who quote unquote approves all of the parts all and is there with the interim deliverables. And so I had to become knowledgeable about clean room manufacturing and how to design it, how, the specifications for designing a clean room. And that would end up being useful to me as I understood some of the TSA technology for screen, their unsuccessful methods for you know screening uh, passengers. Um, and and basically uh, learned that by, by delving into reading the actual requirements, reading the laws, and then again, reading anything I could get my hands on that helped me with those things. And then I had my last job before the one I currently have, I believe, where I became the plant manager for the ring manufacturing job, a ring manufacturing plant in Denton for Jostens. Um, that's where I needed to learn some uh, the lost metal casting methods for precious metals. I also had to learn um, the fundamentals of plant maintenance. Um, that's when I learned how to replace a roof on a manufacturing facility and how to make sure that restrooms are clean. Um, I don't know, not the, those, those skills haven't been all that helpful, but <laughs> sometimes they come in handy. Um, and also that's where I learned about the fundamentals of security. Um, and I, I used those uh, to establish our security practice here at Trans Solutions. So a little bit, so hopefully this will be less talking and I'll, I'll get to showing you some of the things that we do today. Um, as Jay said, I'm co-owner of a 27 person um, transportation consulting firm. Um, we provide consulting to airports and airlines worldwide to improve their facilities. And that's what we started, that, that's, that's our offering when we started the company in 1998. Very similar to the things that we collectively did at American Airlines, um, they just decided that they wanted to be uh, Sabre and they wanted us to become a large IT outsourcing company. And we wanted to stick with the business that we had essentially created starting back in the 1990s. So our initial offering was centered around computer simulation modeling. We basically, when I came to, uh, when I came to the group, my, business, my current business partner had already established a simulation modeling practice at airports and uh, looking at planes traveling in the airspace, and they wanted somebody to build a simulation practice of, at airport terminals. And since I had built computer simulation models, on um, desktops. We were lucky to have them way back then, um, but I, I did a very similar thing by modeling the operations of a flight kitchen. I could also model a terminal and that's how I got my job. Um, we were we were successful at that point in time. The airline, you know, we, we were offering our services to um, airports when we separated and started our company. And um, then several years later, 
I wanted to have uh, something else to sell because we have a great network. We just needed something that we could sell more broadly to airports and other customers. So that's when we started the Lean Six Sigma analysis um, or operations excellence practice area. We also have started, started expanding our services to large venue facilities because one of the things about airports that's difficult is they're huge and there's, in terms of simulation modeling, there's an awful lot of entities that get processed in a 24 hour day. And that's what we model when we do airports. So we were fortunate to become the security consultant and simulation consultant for development of the New World Trade Center in New York City after the old ones uh, came down in 2001. Um, we recently worked for the long uh, for the Grand Central Terminal Station, um, develop, helping them develop the new concourse for the Long Island Railroad. Uh, we helped renovate the Dodger Stadium and we worked with the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. I don't know why all of these are, um, well, I guess a lot of these are in New York City and we've done a lot of work in New York City, but we've also done that the same sort of large venue work in lots of places across the country um, and, uh, and and a little bit I guess in the in the world. Um, and then I also we also managed two subcontracts for the Transportation Security Administration that supports their R&D and their acquisition and deployment of new technology. So that's what I do today. What I'm going to do now is stop talking and show you a little bit of, of what I mean by computer simulation. So this, what you, the screen on the left is uh, the, an actual camera in the customs hall at DFW Airport. Um, I'm sorry, this, yeah, uh, the screen on the right. Well, which one is it? <laughs> um, it shows how our simulation model has been, the screen on the left is the simulation and the right is the actual camera. So um, our client did this recording after we did the animation because they were so pleased that our animation looked so much like reality. And what we're doing here is we were helping them figure out how to improve the customer service just by changing the layout of the facility. So, um, that's probably adequate. So I'll go on to the next one. So this is a simulation model that, uh, that we built for the Pittsburgh International Terminal Modernization Program. And what, you, what we're looking at now is we're looking at the curbside uh, of the terminal um, and you're entering it, you can see that uh, the big red thing is the Pittsburgh terminal, which we'll be working on. But one of the things that's unique about our service offering is that we are able to integrate uh, both the simulation modeling of the curbside using one simulation tool, um, as well as the passenger flow um, from the parking garage, which is what you're looking at there in the, in the crosswalk, um, with the roadway. Because of course, um, one of the things we find, our, our job is to maximize the throughput of everything about the terminal. And so one of the things that happens when you have at grade crossings is it tends to reduce the capacity of the roadway. So the, what you'll see here is we've got the Uber lot where we were looking at Ubers and how they how they perform on the curbside. Uber has been was a disruptive uh, technology for airports because they really didn't have any type of transportation like that when they initially developed uh, the uh, you know the airport terminal. What the the animation has now switched around to looking at that parking garage, which is where the passengers were, were originating their trip. Um, and you can see it's, it's a multi-level parking garage um, that interfaces with the um, terminal. So now we're looking at level four. And of course, to do this, what we're, what we're, what we're working with is uh, the passenger demand and how it comes to the airport, as well as the vehicular demand, which is associated with the passengers and how it comes to the airport. And then um, and then how the airport, how the passengers want to access the terminal. 
this goes on for a pretty long time. I wanted to show uh, the animation of the roadway. And now what's going on is the passengers are entering the terminal and it'll it'll flow through looking at the various passenger processing aspects of the airport terminal. Um, I'm, I'm watching my time here. Um, I think I'll let this go just a little bit longer. For this simulation, the simulation tool that we're using, uh, we're using two different simulation tools. One is all of the roadway that you saw is done in what's considered the industry standard VISSIM curb uh, airport, you know, roadway and curbside uh, simulation model. Now that we're in the terminal, the simulation language that you're seeing used is SIMEO. Um, it's a language for those of you that are industrial engineers or are interested in this. It's being taught in the industrial engineering uh, program at UTA, so that's my plug. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm virtually certain that the VISTM is being taught in the civil engineering program as well. Um, so one of the things that's different about um, the offering of trans solutions is because we're industrial engineers, we understand not only the operations of airlines, which are really quite unusual. Um, most airports who, you know, the, the airlines are tenants of airports and most airlines, re really, most people that are, that work at airports really don't understand airlines. We do, of course, because we came out of an airline, American Airlines, so we know that. We also know the operation of the airport terminal. And one of the things that we, since we work on all aspects of the airport, uh, we do, you know, modeling of planes in the airspace and on the airfield. Um, we also model baggage systems and how how the airline service equipment, its ground ground service equipment, runs around to service the um, airplanes. Then we also understand how baggage system works, how passengers need to be processed through the terminal, and all of that because we understand all aspects of uh, the operation makes us better able to support airport terminal design projects because we know <clears throat> what work has to happen in that airport. And that is industrial engineering is a somewhat misunderstood profession, but that is the thing that we can do for, um, for manufacturing clients um, and banks and hospitals it's a very flexible profession. Now, this may look like we've we've gone outside, <laughs> and and I think what we've done is gone to a bit of the outside at the terminal. And one of the things that airports are trying to do these days um, is to make their terminal better service their passengers and have their passengers be more relaxed. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of things to try to get passengers to enjoy the environment of the airport. So I think that's probably long enough on this. So I'm going to switch topics um, and please go ahead and send your questions to Jay that you may have about you know what we do if you if you if you want to understand either our approach to the business or if you want to understand airports or our airlines better, I'll do my best to answer those questions. Okay, so I've told you a little bit about my path. It's a pretty unusual one. And how was I able to do that? Well, I was able to do that through a lot of people who helped me. And so philanthropy can take a lot of different ways when you're helping people. Um, it's it's you can help with your time if you don't have a lot of money. And there's cert certainly early in our career, we probably don't have a lot of money. Um, you can help with, but you can help with your time. You can help with your money. You can also help with your, ta your talent. And so one of the things I have always tried to do is to pay back or to pay forward all the people that helped me. You know, there was my really good friend uh, who helped get me into industrial engineering. Um, there were all my professors at UTA that taught me how to be a professional. Um, you know, one of my professor, professors, Eleanor Pape, drug me to all my industrial, in, you know, my Institute of Industrial Engineers uh, uh, conferences, uh, meetings first and then conferences and told me that's what professionals do. 
Um, so I do my best to try to drag drag people to you know their professional our professional society. Um, and why do I do this? A couple of reasons because I am so grateful for all the people that helped me. The other one is that because I can make a difference. And one of the things that I think is very important, you know, you go through life and you try to figure out what you're going to do to support yourself. You pick up a family. You want to support your family. You look around and you're saying, well, you know, I have a nice house. I have a nice car. I have nice clothes. Um, what else could I do? What could I do to help people? And when what I've learned is that when you help people, especially in areas where you can really make a unique difference, and we all have those things that we can do, it feels really good. Um, it also has taught me incredible lessons. Um, when I first served the the uh, UTA Alumni Association Board, you know, I was a pretty arrogant engineer. I was sure engineers knew it all, and they were the best profession to do anything in the entire world. Um, and of course, I learned that there were some things maybe we didn't know that much about, you know, human resources, um, organizational developments. Um, a lot of engineers don't that know that much about art. Um, I personally, of course, know that because of my early roots. Um, but you learn things that really help you in your career. So that's sort of my um, pitch for it's, you know, it's not all altruistic, but it does help a lot of people and that does feel good. The other pitch that I would make is that corporate responsibility and social justice is very important. Engineers study sustainability um, and there are a lot of, you know, that that word is defined a lot of different ways. The one that always makes sense to me is that it has to be economically, environmentally and um, social from social justice it all has to be sustainable and to me that's a very powerful concept and so um that environment that environmental justice aspect of it um it gets into social justice um it also there's a new thing that um lots of companies know about and it's their corporate responsibility and what they're finding is that their stakeholders their shareholders as well as some of their uh, investors really expect them to take corporate responsibility and ensure that their operations are sustainable and that they are that they are supporting the greater society in a way that um, makes life better for everyone and so I suspect those of you that are going to take on jobs soon will become a part of a company that's very important. That's very important to them. And so uh, the other thing I've been finding is that students that are being graduated from college, you know, the new generation of students is far more um, outward looking and concerned about um, their neighbors and social justice than perhaps uh, the people I graduated with. So I guess my final fit pitch for philanthropy is it's fun. It feels really good. You meet wonderful people from sectors different than you might encounter in your regular life. And that's good because you learn a lot of things from them. And you also build lifelong bonds. And all of those are so they make our lives so much more rich. And so that's my pitch for philanthropy. Um, UTA has a, uh, the College of Engineering has great ways um, that you can pay back and support them with your time, treasure, and talent. So just, you know, contact the Dean's office. I would say contact Tanya Rosenberger and she can help you uh, channel that if you want to start early. Okay, so this is my final pitch. Um, and, and basically, I'm going to do the bottom line up front. Engineers must get involved in influencing policy. Um, the 115th Congress, and that was when I, the last time I could get a statistic for this, so it's a little dated, but I don't think it's gotten any better. <laughs> the 115th Congress, that was 2017 to 2019, there were 11 engineers or scientists out of 435 uh, uh, you know, Congress people. Now, what does Congress do for us? 
they they develop rules for governing the allocation of bandwidth um, and what the F FCC can do. And frankly, somebody really dropped the, the ball from the airport's perspective with the 5G uh, fiasco. Because um, right now, if you get a, if anybody using that bandwidth near an airport, near an airport, it, it kind of interferes with the avionics, and so um, nobody discussed this with, uh, you know, they when they gave this away, they didn't discuss it with airports or airlines. Um, people in Europe did, but if you're unaware <laughs> of these of these types of facts. Um, these sorts of things happen. They are also now trying to develop uh, trying to develop different strategies to bring semiconductor manufacturing back on shore. Um, I think that we, they probably could have done something originally to keep it on shore originally, um, but they it, they somebody did not do the the calculation properly and take into consideration the overhead uh, because of language issues or the lo logistics of transferring things off the airport, off of the US and back onto the US. They also run the National Academies of Science. And um, one of the things, because I serve on a National Academy of Science, uh, you know, uh, the ACRP oversight, there's things that we have to be cautious about in terms of taking on research because depending on who's in who's in who's in the house at the time, um, we don't want to raise a concern. There's a new technology directorate being um, developed at the National Science Foundation, and their job is to take on a lot of these challenges. And I guess what I would say to you is Congress could. Uh, Congress would be able to do their job a little more effectively if we had more engineers or scientists that are in Congress. So that's something I would advocate. First of all, in terms of policy, you need to be aware of the policy, the, the policy, the US laws, and in some cases, you know, the global laws in the professions that you plan to practice your trade in, because it impacts what you can do. The other thing, uh, Thomas Jefferson was the one who is credited with saying that an informed electorate is a prerequisite for democra democracy. That's a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of wordsmithing on my part, but the number of science deniers is growing. I looked, I tried to look for a statistic, but there's if you if you Google science deniers, you're going to come up with not only some of the things that have to do with climate science, but other things. Um, there's people there. The flat earthers are actually a thing. <laughs> and so um, there's a there's a group that started tra tracking um, some of the impacts. And what's happening is because it's a growing enough uh, percentage of our country that does this, um, Congress is having to be influenced by this. So um, I would pitch to you that we really need to get as engineers and scientists, we have a social responsibility to give back to society to, to help them because not everybody's an engineer or scientist. And it's important for us to share our expertise with, uh, with our communities. Okay, so this is the last slide. Uh, I think I'm probably a little early. Um, I've been kind of provocative, so <laughs> we have some time for qu some questions, but some things that I would recommend for as success for anybody, but particularly one of the things that I have found very helpful is to have a set of friends um, who love you enough enough to tell you the truth. You know, you need somebody that that, you know, can watch you and you know you have a vision of yourself but you need to understand how you're how you are viewed by other people and that's what i mean by a mirror how is your style and it has nothing to do with appearance it has to do with how are you perceived by others um, because first of all that will help you um, in just you know developing your life force but it will also help you be successful in your career um, probably this isn't a this is not a surprise. It's very important to learn the politics, and I don't mean just the politics um, of 
our local community or our, our nation. I mean the politics of your workplace. Um, you really need to you know, study the org chart. That's one of the things I did uh, whenever I was had a job, uh, whenever I got a job. I looked at the org chart and where I fit in the org chart, where my boss fit in the org chart, how, where his, feet, his boss fit in the org chart. Um, and, you know, at sometimes when I was uh, very young, I was looking at it because I was planning on going up that org chart <laughs> until I changed my changed my uh, view to become a small business owner. But but still, I still learn the politics. I know the politics of the various airports I work with. I know all of the people who are from the airport director to, you know, engineering director. You really do have to know all of those people and it, because that is how you understand how you can best answer their questions and be that you know be value added to them similarly it's really important to know the context um, one of the jobs that we do in our operations excellence excellence practice is we take down silos of information and it's still just amazing how you know as long as we've been talking about the importance of collaboration how organizations are still very siloed in their knowledge and uh, you know their information and how they use it and one hand doesn't know what the other is doing so it is very helpful if you know the context of what you are working in and then also know the context of the other people working in your space and I think it's very, I like to know the holistic nature of the, you know, the organization I'm working with, working within. And I recommend that to you. Um, you really do need to be courageous and curious and a lifelong learner. You know, the courageous part, you know, when I was working, I had, I, I was working, I've worked in, I guess, four organizations for large companies and um, was fairly successful working in them but there were things some, there were some things i didn't like about all of them and when we got the opportunity to start our small business we took a leap of faith and um you know 24 years later here we are <laughs> and it's been a pretty good ride um although you might want to ask me what i think about being a small business owner we can talk about that but but you know you've got to take that new opportunity um, be curious, look around, uh, you know, maybe not in your work life, but you could, but certainly be curious in your work life, but also be curious about the world around you. Be curious about, um, you know, the not United States, do some traveling. Traveling is very, very important because especially just traveling in the United States and getting out into various sectors of the country, you realize, realize what a big, diverse country we're part of. That's very interesting. And of course, traveling internationally is very um, helpful because it helps you understand other cultures than the United States. And then of course, going along with that, read everything you can. Um, you know, read read magazines. Uh, and, I, and I really advocate going to old fashioned print media. <laughs> Certainly, um, you know, the, the internet is very valuable and we all use it, but you can get into sort of the, the depths of some topics uh, by, by reading uh, magazines and newspapers, um, and of course books, um, very broadening. Um, it is incredibly important that you always be true to your ethics and, and stand and the standards of your profession. Um, we are uh, we are engineers. Many of us need to be professional engineers. There's an engineering code of ethics. If you don't know about it, please look it up and read it, because that is your obligation for taking on this profession is to uphold those those ethics and those standards, and that way bridges don't fall down. Uh, so that along with, I guess, the lifelong learner part. Now, I have an allusion to bridges. Um, I always thought I was a straight shooter and I would I would convey to people what I think. Um, and those of you that know me know I still convey to you what I think. You probably got it from this presentation. Um, and so at one point I thought it was possible to burn bridges. Honestly, um, 
30 years later, it's not possible to burn bridges uh, effectively. Um, it, it, it really would be better to talk first. Um, since I have burned a couple, um, you know, things, you know, things go around um, and it usually does take two people to burn a bridge and the fullness of time um, those bridges have been repaired. But um, that's something that I think is very important, especially for engineers to know. Um, something that we don't talk about a lot in these in our technical presentation, but it's so important that you also have to do something that feeds your joy. Um, I like my profession and when I get to do my profession and politics don't get in the way, um, I really enjoy I really enjoy doing my work, but I also have discovered I really enjoy working out. I really enjoy going to the symphony. I really enjoy going to art museums and, and learning things about some of the things that I did earlier in my career. So whatever it is that floats your boat, it's really important to you. It's really important for you to do that. And I think, you know, we all talk a little bit about work life balance. That's what you need to do. And then finally, the thing that I'd say is use it all. Use whatever you learned, you know, in high school. If you were if you were a student athlete and you learned those things, um, you know, my I, I have a lot to pick from with my various majors in college. <laughs> but um, and then also, I guess I've changed jobs. I've, I've changed not just jobs, but I've changed uh, industries fairly much. I use a lot of all of that stuff to this day. Um, much to my sadness, unfortunately, the the what I learned being a paralegal I is now useful when I review contracts. Uh, not one of the things I like to do. Uh, that doesn't feed my joy, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I'm able, I know a, a lot about some things that help me understand the problems that I encounter and be a better, a better engineer and a better consultant. So that's one of the things you'll find. None of the time you spend learning things or working at jobs, none of it's wasted. You will be able to use it. So with that, um, I will turn it over to uh, Jay to moderate a Q&A session. And look at that, I'm pretty much right on time, 40 hours, 40 minutes, 39 <laughs> minutes and 30 seconds. Huh? Yeah, that was on purpose. I, and I know that because I'm an industrial engineer. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm I'm not sure if I'm on or not, so um, I can then ask you. I think they, they're going to actually just leave you on and not necessarily flap back and forth, flip back and forth because, oh, no, here we are. Hi, everyone. So thank you all for um, watching. If you have any uh, questions, please drop them in the live Q&A session. I'm going to go ahead and I will ask um, Gloria a, que a couple questions I've got from chats and, um, and then uh, from the chat as well as some others. Um, so let me just first ask this first one that's in the chat. It says, with the Pittsburgh simulation model, is that a collaboration of different types of engineers or was it, is it completely developed by IEs? Um, and, and just a, a, an extra comment, the visual animation is great to help non-engineers see what IEs do. So I just want to, so that's the first question in the chat, if that was actually a collaboration of multiple engineers or was it primarily just IEs? Thanks. So um, the design, the design of the terminal, the design of the roadway, it's a collaboration. Uh, the roadway is engineers. The terminal, for the most part, are architects. Um, so we don't design anything. We're like BASF. We don't design anything. We make it better. Now we we do design operations if people you know want us to do that, but it's a collaboration of. Uh, of the engineers that do the design. In terms of the simulation model using VizSim, um, we use VizSim and that is developed by, we like using that because it's the industry standard developed by civil engineers. And so it keeps us um, honest. When before VizSim was applicable at the curbside, um, one of my employees, I would always, you know, until we went in, until we, help develop those types of simulations, um, I would, it was actually um, a PhD 
a graduate of was civil engineering and he had a master's in transportation systems engineering. So um, roadways are something, um, especially the further you get off of a special use roadway, um, you know, you need you need to be a civil engineer because you need to understand the kinetics of the traveling of the of the vehicles. Um, I will say this, um, there's a lot of air, there's a lot of passenger processing that goes on at cur curbsides of, of uh, airport terminals. And so when it, that processing is something that we have found that our um, our tool, our more our Simeo tools are actually better for representing some of those processes. And so that's one of the interesting things about that is melding the animations uh, together and melding the output of the simulations. Um, before uh, there were some advances in uh, computing technology um, that helps that meld look better and that animation. Um, but um, when we started early days, we have had a couple of projects where we modeled, you know, to model the airspace and the airfield. Um, that's certainly a different tool. Um, it can be SIMOD, it can be TAMS, it can be AirTop, different different tools. Then we sort of mat, we do a, we match the findings from that to that tool to then we put them in our terminal and we use Simio, and so that's really the 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 area of industrial engineers. Um, we consult. You know, for example, there's a guy that uh, is an expert up about pedestrian flow modeling. His name is John J. Fruin. He did his work in 1970, the late 1970s, and nobody's improved on it. Um, there's a book that I that I consider the Bible. Mine's all tattered. You could also get it in the Highway Capacity Manual. So again, it's it's research that we've that we've put into some of how we develop our simio models. And then there's the VISM and um, melding that. Early days we used CORSIM and we would meld our some of our models with our, you know, with the simio models. Did I answer the question? I, I think so. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if anybody can hear me, but uh, anybody else can hear me. Um, so let me slowly ask the second question um, or you may have to repeat it. Um, so the, the next question is, have you ever had to turn down a client because you did not agree with their stance on ethics and standards? How did you handle it? Um, so that's it's not like you interview your clients at the beginning of a. OK, so the question is, have I turned down work because they're ethics and standards? Um, it's not the sort of thing that you you do an interview in in, in front of it. Um, trans, but trans solutions, you know, our ethics and standards are paramount because the only reason that you know, I have to, I'm always a sub consultant. And so I have to have a good reputation. I have to be credible and I have to work with, you know, lots of lots of clients that are airports, but certainly a lot of engineers and car architecture firms. The way we've handled it, and honestly, it's a good industry. And um, that's one of the good things about it. I don't know if it's especially good, you know, relative to other industries, but um, sometimes we'll, we'll work for a client and they will not like the answer. And so we will talk with them about, well, why don't you like that answer? And, um, you know, if they don't believe something or they want us to run a sensitivity, we'll run a sensitivity to see, you know, did we miss something or whatever? But at, at the end of the day, when um, the answer is the answer, I explain to them that, um, sorry, um, we are not the type of consultant that is going to tailor the answer to, you know, the answer is the answer. Now, if you don't like that, um, you know, what what I would tell them is that you, you know, we this is what we can, you know, this is what we can say, and we can develop a context, you know, for the reader to maybe understand it. If that's not okay with you, um, we don't have to tell anybody that we did this work. <laughs> but um, but what I actually did in that instance is, you know, they in my report um, they paid me to put 
you know, I did the part that they wanted me to do, and that was the answer. And then I contributed on my own dime the part of the report they didn't pay me to look at and published that such that it would provide, you know, in the report, it provides the context. So um, back to, you know, people make decisions on our work. And it's very important that it be the best information we know. Um, and a lot of times clients, um, you know, are conservative, they don't want to spend the money. If we think something is, you know, a borderline question, so we'll make sure we do some sensitivity analysis so that we can share that on our own dime, so that we can share it with the client so that they know it's a close thing. Thank you. Um, I think we can go. Let, I've just got just a couple more, uh, a couple more questions. One was just generally, you know, how many people, uh, kind of, how many person hours go into a simulation like the one for the Pittsburgh airport? Uh, that was, I think, it was a very quick project. Uh, probably it was eight, eight weeks. Um, there's a project manager um, who worked almost full time, and then there were two other people. So, um, so I have also one other kind of larger question. So, one of the things that um, this is this is one you can expand on. You've already commented on quite a bit, but you know, most engineers sort of talk about devices, right? We have a lot of people who like to talk about the engineer, and you talk a lot about people. And so I just wanted to get your comments on that. <laughs> well, Jay, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of softball. <laughs> so industrial engineers take a lot of heat. Some people like talk to us about call us imaginary engineers. That always works for me because it is important to have an imagination. But we are supposed to be the engineer that puts it all together. We put people process, equipment, resources all together. And one of the things that I, if we think, let me take, let me take the, T, the Transportation Security Administration as an example, because they're the ones that drive me absolutely nuts about this. Um, you, you think about it and, and with our ability to do screening using all kinds of uh, different technologies, um, we can find a lot of the very difficult things that are, you know, that are hard to, that are hard to find. Now, there's, there's some things we, my opinion, we don't need to find because we have other processes and protocols that have been put in place to, 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 you know, to solve those problems. But from a screening, from a technology perspective, we, we have incredible power. OK, now what are we going to do? We're going to give that power to a human being, right? OK, so the human being, let's talk about the transportation security officer. That human being needs to be able there. We, we with some of the technology, the the transportation security officer is getting some help to screen what they see in luggage and to pick out bad things and to say, OK, I'm going to have to look. I'm going to open this bag and I'm going to have to look to see if that's, you know, is that C4 or is that peanut butter? <laughs> so so, you know, we have the technology that, you know, we can help that officer do that job. But there's some things that there's some things that are called shield alarms where they don't necessarily see that. So it comes down to the expertise of the officer. And I've just been thinking about the officer in the bag room. Your carry on luggage is actually harder to screen. And so we've we've also made advances there. We have CT technology that's now deployed at, you know, at checkpoints. And so the officer can see what's in that bag a lot better. We can also they can also turn it over to, you know, some, some remote viewers and they can do it too. But at the end of the day, you've given a very sophisticated piece of equipment to a transportation security officer that in many cases does not have a degree, does not know physics. Um, they only know about the protocols that they've been given. 
And um, the protocols are written by industrial engineers who do know the physics and do know what needs what the process needs to be. And if we're lucky, those officers are trained. OK, so that's the human interface between the technology and it ends up being implemented by the by the Transportation Security Office. So you need to understand what are the limitations of that that officer who's doing their job in a very crowded airport, looking at a queue of less than happy passengers who are pressuring them <laughs> to get through the line. Then the, uh, the other part of it is that it, at, at, for airport security, your product, if you think about it, is a secure passenger and a secure piece of baggage. Okay, so so in the case, in that case, it's a person that's your, you know, your raw material <laughs> that you're trying to translate from being an unsecure passenger potentially to make sure they're a secure passenger. So it's very important that you have that context of your device and who's going to use it. I guess the other thing I would say, a story back from my black program at Texas Instruments, my job was to uh, stamp product. And if it, it and, and so I had to do a config, configuration audit. I had to make sure all the things in it were, were the parts that needed to be in it. And so I would have these young mechanical engineers that would come to me and they'd want me to approve use of a non-military grade part. And they would tell me, but it has so much more performance. I can get a lot more performance out of this. And I was like, pardon me, but this product is supposed to be launched into space and it's supposed to work in space. And otherwise, if it doesn't work, if it isn't robust enough to handle all of the thermodynamic stresses that go on it, it won't do anything. <laughs> and so, sorry, um, that's why we have DOD specs and why I'm not going to stamp your part off. So it, and as a young engineer, you know, Sometimes you you take at that point you think about it. I had four and a half years of experience, bachelor's degree, but I'm standing up to people as an engineer. That's my responsibility. And if we think about um, you know people, the stories that we hear about very recently about airplanes that kind of didn't work, um, you know that that young engineer is the one who has to be gutsy enough to stand up to people and understand the holistic picture of what they're doing, not just the performance of the device. But thank you for asking that question, Jay. <laughs> That's well, industrial engineer explained, industrial yes. engineering explained. <laughs> So yes, this is all super exciting. And again, um, that's we, we're out of time now, so I can't ask any more questions. Unfortunately, we could have done this all afternoon. Um, <laughs> thank, uh, thank you so much again for 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 being a speaker this week, uh, uh, Gloria. Um, I'd um, just also like to also thank everybody else who was in attendance. And just as a reminder, again, to see the full brown bag schedule, um, including previous, uh, including previous presentations, and um, what upcoming presentations, you can go to. It looks like go.uta.edu/coe-vbb uh, for a virtual brown bag. So that's and, again. And yes. Jay, can I say one more thing? Do I still have the floor? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, let me just thank the guys that helped me get this to you. Uh, Andy Interkin and Prasanna Kavapati. Prasanna is, is a graduate of the IE program at UTA as well. Uh, Andy's from Georgia Tech. Pretty good school too. <laughs> so, well, again, thank you. So I guess with that, I guess we'll go ahead and close and say bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye. -bye. bye.